so I'm flattered. Gosh, thank you so much. Ah, okay. Oh, very interesting. I'm so sorry. You're all got. Yes. Any email address that you can. If you have a spare card, I can write write it for you. It's very easy. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. There we go. Thank you so much. Very nice to meet you. Yes. Yes. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Here we are in, uh, I believe it's the Vietnam room. Yes, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a uh, very good afternoon to you. I trust you've uh, had a good lunch. Uh, whoever is remaining, if we could please ask you to, to come and join us here, and we can get the session uh, underway. There we go.
Okay, my name is Martin Sun. I'm from CNBC. It's my honor and also pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome. We know what this plenary session is about, but before we begin, just a, a couple of quick housekeeping uh, items for you all and for, for the panelists as well. Uh, you probably need to be aware that this is an open session. Uh, on the record, some members of the media, my brother may be here in the audience, uh, it's going to be webcast live. So this is for your reference in case there are questions and also for, for the panelists. This is all on the record, in, uh, in other words. If anybody has uh, cell phones, any sorts of other communication devices, if you could please ideally turn them off, if you, or if you really cannot, uh, silent would be all right, uh, just as a matter of courtesy while this uh, session is underway. And format-wise, what has happened before, I know, is very sequential and set piece, sort of pitched battle, and then right towards the end, we'll uh, draw questions out from the floor, from the audience. We can do that. That's nice and safe if we can get through this session. Uh, but if possible, I'd like to get you folks engaged sooner rather than later. If you have a question or even comments for any of our uh, panelists here, all we, all we ask is, in terms of protocol, tell us who you are, where you're from or who you represent, and also who your question or comment is to. That would be very helpful. And I believe there should be uh, roving microphones that come to you. So just raise your hands, OK? Uh, in terms of timekeeping, we've got about 75 minutes or an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, this is World Economic Forum, so we're running on Swiss time. <laughs> Uh, we're getting started, I believe, on the dot, and uh, I think we need to end on the dot uh, as well because there are other plenary sessions and uh, people are busy. They want to meet other people in uh, network, which is what this whole uh, conclave is, is all about. Again, our theme, Redrawing the Green Print of Asia's Energy Architecture, we know that. What I'd like to do before I introduce you to the panelists, though, um, is to do this get to this underlying question. My brief is fairly simple. We're trying to get to the bottom of one core question, and that is how this part of the world, Asia, can design a comprehensive blueprint, or green print, as it were, to manage the transition, the change, to a wider spectrum of energy resources out here in Asia. Uh, we'll talk about economic, also political frameworks, what's needed to enable this, New resources, innovations, technology, what's available, what is cost effective, what's realistic, and also supply chain security, because at the bottom of this, feeding and also powering Asia sustainably uh, in the future is going to depend on, if not energy independence, at least a bit more security and, uh, and a little bit more self reliance, uh, I think. Underlying all, all this, of course, is what we've seen happen to oil, although prices have come back down and give some people, including corporates, uh, some comfort. What I'd like to do to start with, though, is I'm going to spring a surprise. I told some of the panelists, but not all about this, and none of you know about this. I'm going to deviate a little bit from the usual WEF plan. <laughs> what we're talking about this afternoon, I think, is very topical, very topical, especially post-311 in Japan the nuclear disaster, earthquake, tsunami, and subsequent nuclear disaster. It's raising a lot of questions. We've seen the backlash in the West, Germany, several other states as well. Out here in Asia, though, it's a little bit more uncertain. Places like Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, China, obviously, India. What I'd like to do now is to get the audience involved. First off, just a real simple poll. It's binary, just yes or no. Give me a show of hands whether you folks think should nuclear be part of Asia's energy future? I mean, look, it's not as simple as yes and no. I know that. But come on, let's just get this thing start, started. Who's for yes? Raise your hands, please. Wow. OK, that's, I'm, I'm kind of surprised. And no's? That's actually pretty surprising and, and interesting as well. And this is a good way to kick off, I think. So the majority, I'd put it at. Oh, to be generous, maybe 70% yes, 30% no to the question, should nuclear be part of Asia's energy future? Let me pose this question to our guests, but I need to introduce our panelists first, of course. Just next to me, uh, Gerard Mesterle, GDF, 
next to him, uh, we've got uh, Trimumpuni from Ibeka, Abeka, excuse me, which is an NGO co-op type uh, organization, which does a lot of work ground up at the village and community level with hydropower. It's a very interesting uh, story she has. Next to her, of course, is Karen uh, Augustiwan, CEO of Perkamina, uh, Melody Meyer, Chevron Asia Pacific head, and last but not least, right at the very end, uh, of course, uh, we've got Prashant Ruia, who is uh, the head of the SR group in India, the big conglomerate power generator uh, as well. So these are our panelists. 70-30, yes nuclear, no nuclear to, to Asia's power or energy future. Gerard, what do you say? Yes, sir. I consider that uh, nuclear is part of the solution, will be part of the solution everywhere in the world, of course, depending on the, the political choice of uh, each country. Uh, as we are concerned as an energy group, 10% uh, of our uh, power is produced through uh, seven nuclear plants that we have in, uh, in Belgium. We, have the, uh, we own and operate the totality of the nuclear plants in Belgium. And um, uh, I consider that uh, uh, nuclear for base load generation has a role to play. What is surprising uh, after Fukushima is that um, the reactions have not been the same in Asia and in Europe or even in the States. Uh, most, many countries in Asia have decided to stick to nuclear. Does that surprise you? Uh, a little bit, Given because, that it, happened because it, it happened in the, the accident, dramatic accident happened in Asia. Yeah. And nevertheless, most of the Asian countries, including Japan, have decided to keep uh, nuclear. In Europe, uh, and in Western Europe, where there never has been any accident, any severe accident in uh, nuclear, the Germany has decided to withdraw mm -hmm. and to stop. Uh, Switzerland has decided to stop, and Italy is uh, deciding today or tomorrow in a referendum also uh, either to, to come back in nuclear or perhaps more likely mm -hmm. uh, to, to uh, close the, the, the definitely the door to, to nuclear. Uh, in the US, some operators have decided to stop projects, uh, creating write-offs. So in, in um, Europe and in the States, um, there are some uh, hesitations, and we don't know today what we know what will happen in Germany, Switzerland, and Italy, but uh, not yet the reactions of the other countries. Mm. Uh, they will um, make the, the stress test, and of course, uh, they will have to decide after the stress test whether they, they close down some plants or not, and also what will be their final uh, commitment towards nuclear. Uh, I consider as a, a power group and energy group that uh, uh, using the most modern um, specifications of the third generation nuclear plants, uh, such as uh, EPR uh, designed by Areva or uh, Atmea, a smaller one designed jointly by Areva and the Mitsubishi, uh, have very safe uh, reactors, okay. much safer than all the existing uh, nuclear plants uh, that, that are okay. run all over the world. And uh, of course, this, it is a sovereign decision of each government, each country, depending on the public opinion, mm. either to, to, uh, to continue or to enter into the nuclear power genera generation, mm -hmm. Um, but uh, as an industrial uh, industrialist, I consider that uh, nuclear is uh, um, an element of the solution. Okay. Uh, because especially here in in Asia, in Asia, the the, the the first element to take into account is the the strong demand from for the coming. Uh, 20 years and 30 years. Mm -hmm. The demand will be the physical de demand, physical consumption of, uh, of uh, energy and power yeah. 
will grow at a pace which will be more or less double than the rhythm of the rest of the world. Mm. So there is a need for growth, uh, for energy. Without enough energy supply, there will not be a growth. Right. There is no economic growth without uh, enough supply of yeah. energy and electricity. So, right. so neighbor is, is part of the solution to it is part these of energy the solution, demands yes. and needs in third or maybe even fourth generation technology analysis yeah. is safe. But at the end of the day, it's a question of political will. Absolutely, I think. Okay, Trimon Puni, you've heard the, our, our straw poll or seen our straw poll. Seventy percent yes, nuclear. Thirty percent no. What say you? Well, I think. If you're talking about nuclear power plant, it's just like taking an aeroplane. You know, it has to be prepared technically and human resources. So you see how many people are taking aeroplane, you know. But if something happened, finish. If an accident in the aeroplane, you know, there is nothing left. So this is exactly the way you ask yourself. Do you want to take a plane or you want to walk? This is in my opinion. But in the case of Indonesia, you know, in ASEAN especially, where there are so many potential from renewable energy, for instance, you know, we have to really make it an optimum. You know, we still have a geothermal, uh, everything, every renewable energy sources, you know, if it's possible. This is uh, based on the culture mindset of the community. Because what or I'm talking here, you know, with the economic uh, growth uh, and also some effort that the government trying to, to catch up, this is big lack, you know, because the, the demand of the electricity is increasing, but uh, in a way that infrastructure to provide that is very left behind. Mm. So the thing is to answer whether we need the nuclear or not, in my opinion, is we have to really make the society decided where are they going to you know to drive their their development you know okay. because i know that that nuclear is just possible it's possible but it's not the answer for the present condition you don't think due, so. due to uh, so many local resources that are possible to be developed hmm. this is this is what I, my opinion but we never know in the next 50 years 100 years where all the resources has been dig up and we don't have anything left, then it's, there's no solution. We should have an answer. Then that's what and I say, that maybe possibility. Nuclear. Maybe. Okay. All right. Ibu? Um, I did, I, I mentioned in my, in uh, some of my roundtable discussion that I am always open into any options of energy. And I think we should not shut ourselves into any kind of energy. We should be open, you know, be open-minded and be prepared. Uh, the only thing that I, ha I have uh, concerns regarding nuclear energy is, you know, I, I heard that it is in the fourth generation, Gerard, I know that you say it's safe. Uh, when you have this nuclear plant in Indonesia, please be aware that you have the system, you have the process, but it is the people who is handling the nuclear plant, you know. Are they aware that, you know, this is about, uh, you know, running a, a, a safe environment, a safe uh, plant? You know, th that type of discipline that uh, uh, is actually worrying me most. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, worried about the technology. I'm not worried about, you know, uh, 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 about, about it being operating, but I'm worried about the human resources. Are we ready, basically, mm. from this region, uh, from my country, in terms of human resources? Mm. Because, uh, I, I mean, if you look at, 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 at uh, you know, uh, um, 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 uh, um, companies, you know, national companies operating, I think the HSE level, yes, we are trying to move up, but the awareness of HSE is not where to the, uh, compared to the other international companies. Mm. So this is, this is the, uh, the gap that I think we need to fill in. Okay, this is a very interesting point because in my discussions earlier uh, uh, today as well as yesterday, uh, this whole question of infrastructure needs uh, in Indonesia, one of the big challenges I think uh, in the way of uh, further development of rollout or build out in terms of PPPs is precisely that. I mean, one obviously is money, but two is the actual implementation and management, especially because of centralization. You need people, it, uh, it's not as easy as importing uh, technical expertise. They need to speak Bahasa, mm -hmm. uh, for one. Yeah. Uh, Melody? 
So um, maintaining Asia's growth trajectory is extremely important uh, for the world. And certainly to meet the increasing demand for energy, uh, we're, we're going to need all forms of energy. We're going to need nuclear. Nuclear will continue to play a role. We'll need fossil fuels. Today, fossil fuels provide a significant percentage of our energy demand uh, needs in, in the region. And we expect over the next couple decades that fossil fuels will also play a significant role. But there'll be emerging um, role for renewables and alternatives. Uh, certainly, renewables uh, at scale that don't require subsidies are important. But having all forms of energy is very, very important. And this, this region is uh, uniquely blessed with fossil fuels, uh, oil, natural gas, significantly uh, growing resources in natural gas. Certainly geothermal is a, a big part of uh, this region. Our, my company is a very large uh, producer of geothermal here in Indonesia, over 50%. But uh, there are opportunities to continue to expand in the areas of geothermal. So bottom line, we're going to need all forms of energy to meet that growing demand in this region. Okay. Now, before we get to Prashat, I'm going to be a bit of a spoiler because we've talked several times <laughs> before. I know exactly what his position is. But, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I, I think um, uh, clearly India has a – I mean, we've heard about the region and Indonesia. Uh, India has a slightly different problem. We, we, the need for power and energy is significant. Uh, currently, we are, uh, we're producing about 150 gigawatts of power, and uh, we need another 350 to 400 gigawatts over the next two decades to meet the total requirements of the country. Uh, and if you, if you take China today, they're closer to 800,000 uh, megawatts, or 800 gigawatts already today. So, uh, and uh, we don't have the same level of natural fossil fuel resources, whether it's oil or, or natural gas. Uh, and therefore, I think, uh, at least from an Indian perspective, uh, all alternate source of power, including uh, nuclear, is something which uh, I think the country is going to pursue. Uh, last year, we signed the um, NPT, the treaty for permitting additional nuclear power plants, and I think uh, while the safety and uh, the technology is available, obviously there's going to be a debate post uh, the 311, but, uh, but I think in the end uh, it will come around to uh, all sources of power, including nuclear. Including nuclear, but the interesting thing is uh, to meet India's more immediate needs because it is underpowered. The statistic that sticks in my mind is what, 40? 45%, 45%. Yeah, of people don't have access to power okay. even now. So, I mean, it's not just a question of, I mean, safety and security is very important, but it's also a question of making sure that every individual gets access to power, which mm. to me is the first, will be the government's first objective. And, uh, and they'll have to live with the resources available to it. Okay, we have to come clean here. There are vested interests. I mean, uh, SR is a power generator. You've been quoted widely, publicly, extensively saying that, look, uh, to paraphrase, I mean, look, everybody wants the lights on. In India, I think they wanted it on yesterday, right? Right. The problem is it's got to be affordable, and that argues for coal, you think. I mean, clearly, um, uh, the, the people who are going to consume the power now um, are, uh, have to get it at an affordable price. Mm. And, and for that, you have to use the resources which we have in India, which is largely available, which is coal. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, the cost of power generated from coal is clearly amongst the lowest, uh, clearly the lowest uh, after uh, probably hydro. Uh, and again, there isn't abundant resources of, of possibility of generating hydropower in India. So I think coal is going to be, it's today 55 or 60 percent of our total generation. Right. I think it's going to remain in that range. All right. Let me ask you a slightly controversial question. When you look at uh, China, for example, we know, uh, of course, they also have huge energy needs, uh, probably not as much of a shortfall as, uh, uh, as India. They're also leaders in renewables and solar, very big in wind as well. And they've also got one of the most aggressive nuclear build-out programs on the planet. Are they getting their math wrong then? Is that what you're saying? No, I don't think they're getting their math wrong. I think um, it's, as I said, even India will build out nuclear over time. Yeah. But it's a seven to eight year program to build, uh, to build these plants. Yeah. And we only got uh, approvals, international approvals last year. Yeah. So they're still, you know, under uh, development. Yeah. And at the same time, we have immediate power requirements. Those are going to get, get met by coal, coal-based power or gas-based power uh, or hydro. Yeah. And then in the next phase, uh, which is closer to a decade from now, is when I think you will get uh, access to nuclear power. 
Okay. China is a bit ahead of us. I think they started a few years ago, yeah. and they'll get it. They'll get the power probably earlier. Okay. One point that uh, Prashant made in our earlier discussions, and this comes back around to what Freeman Puni was saying: yeah. that this decision needs to be inclusive, and very much from the ground up. And what Gerard was saying: it, it's a political decision, uh, 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 an issue of sovereignty uh, at the end. The big difference here is: I mean, India, you're talking about the biggest democracy in the world. In China, basically, I mean, let's be honest about this. They can do what they want. Is that fair? That's the the decision, the sovereign decision of the the the, the, the country. Uh, first of all, I, w I would like to to precise that all over the world, uh, nuclear represents 15 percent. Mm. So 85 percent of the power generation in the world uh, comes from other technologies than nuclear, and in the future, nuclear will not represent. Uh, in the long run, uh, even before Fukushima, uh, more than than 15 percent, okay. um, because the, the the existing 15 percent have been uh, built mainly in the 70s and 80s, uh, and after after um, Chernobyl, uh, all the construction have been stopped in uh, Western countries, only in China, India, and Japan and Korea there was some construction of nuclear plants. Um, but uh, today, the percentage of nuclear is declining because, because most of the new construction uh, of, uh, of uh, power generation are uh, based on coal, based on gas, or renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, and hydro, I include hydro in renewables. Uh, so even in China, it is important uh, nuclear, the, 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 the big program, but natural gas, the natural gas developments even in China will be even greater than, than, uh, uh, than nuclear. And perhaps that would be what I wanted to underline. Uh, uh, after Fukushima, the, the winners in terms of technology will be renewables, and that is what is in mind of uh, uh, the population public opinion, um, you will replace nuclear by renewables, that's simple, but in fact that would not be exactly the case. Mm -hmm. A very significant part of the space left by the uh, nuclear uh, will be occupied by natural gas. Uh, you have just seen perhaps the document uh, published by the International Energy Ag Agency. Uh, last week about uh, the future of energy and the title is the golden age of gas and the see the uh, and I agree with that the natural gas as the leading energy of the 21st century mm -hmm. uh, because you have lots of reserves between one century and two century uh, thanks to the not only the classical natural gas, but also the unconventional gas, uh, shale gas, uh, notably. So you will have plenty of natural gas. And big countries like China, uh, but also uh, like uh, US, mm -hmm. uh, have decided, and Indonesia, have decided, have decided to burn a, a, a thing, to give a significant role yeah. to, to uh, natural gas. Uh, which will become, thanks to LNG, liquefied natural gas, uh, a, a world renewable market, mm -hmm. which is not the case uh, so far. What about efficiency, cost effectiveness? If you, if you need to import it, how does it compare to, I, I should know this, it's a silly question, but I'll ask it, compared to, let's say, coal? Well, of course, it depends on the, the immediate uh, price of, uh, of natural gas so far. Uh, natural gas, for example, in the U.S. market is very cheap, very cheap compared to coal. Uh, that is not the case everywhere. But in the, in the U.S. market, uh, they have stopped building uh, coal power plants, and the natural gas is replacing, uh, because uh, locally you have enormous quantities of shale gas, unconventional gas, and the price uh, is around four uh, U.S. dollars per million BTU in the in the U.S. Of course, the U.S. Uh, are becoming uh, a gas island 
uh, they no longer import natural gas. Unfortunately for us, we were the, we used to be the largest importer of LNG in the U.S. market, mm. and now they, they, they are independent yeah. on the gas point of view, uh, but they do not export. So it is an island. Mm -hmm. It is a, a, a quite isolated market, uh, and therefore the, the natural gas on other markets, such as Europe, uh, um, quite double the price of the U.S. market. Wow. So it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's different. And just one last observation uh, in terms of uh, climate change. Uh, natural gas is much more efficient than coal. Uh, the uh, emission of CO2 uh, are half, 50% of the one of coal. And to illustrate that, in Europe, you know that Europe has uh, um, uh, this is even with clean or cleaner coal technology? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. yes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Europe has, has decided uh, very tough commitments in order of reducing CO2 emissions. Mm. Uh, minus 20% in 2020. But if the totality of the coal plants in, uh, in Europe would be converted into gas plants, mm -hmm. Those, those uh, targets would be reached immediately mm. in one time because, because natural gas is uh, much cleaner than, 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 than coal. Krishan, let's bring you in on this and I guess let you no, uh, think, uh, defend yourself. Go ahead. I totally agree with, um, you know, in terms of the U.S., that absolutely makes sense to, to go down the gas path. Their gas reserves have gone from 30 years to 125 years since they've got shale gas uh, discoveries and production. Mm -hmm. But I think in the region, in Asia, the, the situation is slightly different. Okay. Um, there isn't ac sufficient access to gas, and if you were to uh, buy LNG and build power plants off that, which is a traded gas, uh, the cost of that is significantly higher than the $4 which uh, Gerard was talking about. Okay, talk to us about your own uh, company corporate experience. I know that you have a, a very aggressive build-out program right. in terms of capacity. Within three years, you're going to, I think, double your uh, output. In terms of getting access to the actual material, the coal, much of that is in India's interior, but it's not easy. Yeah. Well, uh, the initial uh, build-out of power plants, which we did at SR, was, uh, was gas-based. So we have uh, a little below 2,000 megawatts of gas-based power. And then, we, and then we came across the shortage of uh, sufficient natural gas in the country. And therefore, the expansion which we are doing, we are adding on another 8,000 megawatts of power, 8 gigawatts. And uh, all of that is on coal, based uh, in the interior of the country, based on domestic uh, coal mines. And that program is underway and will be completed over the next uh, two years' time. Okay. But, uh, I mean, you're also looking at assets here, obviously, in Indonesia thermal coal, which has a higher sulfur content, it's, it's, well, frankly, better quality than the stuff in the interior of India, no? Yeah, certainly. It's the, the quality of coal here is, uh, is better. Yeah. But uh, most of the coal which comes into India from countries like Indonesia or Australia will be primarily used along for plants along the coast of the country. Ah, and if you're building power plants in the interior of the country, then you normally go for the uh, okay. domestic coal. All right, let's uh, bring uh, Tri Mumpuni in on this. Uh, we have, uh, Gerard, you've touched on... Uh, renewables. Talk to us about your experience. I find it fascinating because what is happening is this is very much bottom up. It's economic empowerment. It's not just self sufficiency and economic uh, independence, but you've got some projects where after a, a village or a community meets its own needs from your micro hydro projects, mm -hmm. you sell the surplus to the grid. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to to do is, is I call it against all odds. You know, if people are thinking big, uh, you're talking about you know bringing with the huge uh, power supply from one place to another place, megawatt. I love just to say something that really sufficient, sustainable, make sure that the ownership in the local level. You know, this is this is what what in 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 the opinion when the first time we start with this was thinking that Indonesia especially we are an island country. It is doesn't make any sense if we would like to have a national grid you know, from, from one island to another island. What is the best way to fulfill the energy demand of the local community? 
the resources is there. Water is plenty everywhere, you know. So what the best thing to do is just we have to make sure that every local community utilizing their own resources mm. to be able to manage by themselves because this is will sustain, you know, this is what very important is locally ownership and then sustainable. Mm -hmm. And what we do is I always tell them that the electricity is not for infrastructure. This is a trigger for economic development. Okay. So this is very important part. The thing, when they enough, you know, they have enough electricity to trigger their economic development locally, then they have also potential to sell the access to the grid because the demand mostly not very big mm. and the resources is big, so they can sell it to the rest, to the grid. And by selling to the grid, they have their own income. This is what creating dependability, you know, it's dependent really from, from the outside. Uh, you know, uh, support. Mm -hmm. And this is actually, we not only would like to implement this, even we have one power plant in the Philippines owned by the local community. What very important for our nation, you know, and especially other places like Philippines or ASEAN region that we have to give trust to the local community to fulfill their own demand. What we need is just giving an intervention in terms of technology we give uh, technical assistance, we support them with, with fund if there is no fund availability or connect them to the bank because mostly the bank is definitely not interesting come to them unless there is a big support, you know, mostly government or private sector who has heart, mm -hmm. who want to share. And I'm sure this is the three elements of sustainable development can be achieved easily. Mm -hmm. First is economic activity. Yes, it is. There is an energy, there is an economic activity. Environmental support, of course, if you want to have your hydro will be sustainable, you have to make sure that you conserve the environment properly. And the third is community involvement. You involve the community in the mainstream of development. So these three elements, I'm sure that this is somehow the very important pillar for sustainable development, especially also in the energy sector. It's a great story. It makes sense to me as well. I mean, what we're talking about here is real, literal decentralization. I want to bring Ibu and also Melody in on this. Uh, big U.S. oil major, state oil here. What do you make of this? Because I remember Ibu earlier this morning, you were telling me that one of the biggest headaches you face as a result of decentralization in Indonesia the last decade or so is, oh my gosh, at the retail level, mm -hmm. 18,000 islands, it is a nightmare for you. But this idea of decentralization, I'm not suggesting that people go out and drill an oil well or look for oil in the backyard, but, but still, I mean, it, it, it seems to make sense. Mm -hmm. I think uh, 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 providing uh, electricity to uh, the smaller islands, I do agree with uh, Ibu Numpuni that, you know, there are ways that can be uh, uh, um, operated by the local community, but uh, from us, from Pertamina, I think we, we've already, we've already uh, um, uh, have the uh, floating storage for West Java and the second one will be in Central Java. But we do help also um, PLN to distribute the electricity on the further uh, eastern side of, of Indonesia on islands, uh, you know, on a smaller scale, uh, like the 20 megawatts and, and so on, using mini LNGs. So th these are the things that, you know, we, we, we help uh, for electri electrification of the nation. I know that, you know, we are also just like India, only about 60%, so we still have a gap of 40%, and the likelihood of reaching 95% will be only in, I think, in 2025, was that the program from the, for the country. But in the meantime, I think what Pertamina can help is, you know, because we are an energy company, and we, uh, we also have the sources of um, LNG, and, you know, for remote areas, uh, you know, we can do the mini LNGs uh, uh, type of uh, uh, scheme. Okay. But um, uh, for distribution, I think um, uh, I think uh, people in this room need to be aware that um, uh, distribution of fuel is very related to the uh, uh, is not only infrastructure, but it's also uh, uh, politically it is very well connected to the government. Mm. So I think uh, we will not uh, risk the liability of not, you know, if someone or other, uh, uh, should I say, uh, entities of doing the distribution because it, you know, if, if there is no fuel in just one or two retail shops, uh, the news will get into the, uh, uh, the media 
very, uh, very uh, what in five or ten seconds, you know. So this is how sensitive uh, fuel distribution is in Indonesia. Uh, I, so I don't think that uh, you know uh, uh, right now, unless the uh, other entities have the. Uh, 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 infrastructure already in place, especially in remote areas, you know, because that, this is where the uh, complaints usually come from. So uh, otherwise, I think it is, be, it is, I think it is best uh, handled with uh, uh, um, Pertamina as a national oil company because it is the right hand, you know, uh, um, yes, <laughs> arm yeah. of the government no. itself. All right, understood. So. Nolini, what do you think? So, uh, you know, uh, responsive to my earlier comment, we need all forms of energy to meet the growing demand. I, I think that we also need uh, energy at a micro scale and at, at a, a large scale. So I, I think that, you know, there, there are remote micro opportunities all, all across the region yeah. that need micro uh, projects. And I think that that's, there's an excellent fit. I mean, the demand is, is large. So being able to meet that demand through micro projects, projects at scale, different types of uh, energy sources, geothermal, certainly big, big in the region. LNG is um, uh, enabled by technology. I think technology is playing a role in all of these sources, whether it's micro projects or geothermal projects. Certainly uh, the large growth in, in the LNG projects in deep water are enabled through deep water technology and carbon capture sequestration technologies um, to be able to bring those, those resources to market. But technology is playing a big role. Uh, again, I just think we need all forms of energy, micro and global, and uh, renewables at scale okay, are also whatever, important. Whatever we, uh, we can get access or, or make available. I, I need to note here that uh, this isn't necessarily mutually exclusive because offline, uh, before this session, uh, I was talking to both Gerard and uh, Primum Puni, and for one of Primum Puni's projects, GDF is involved with the soft loan. I mean, it's, uh, I'm sure the company can afford it. Mm -hmm. Why did you do it though? What, what does GDF get out of it? Well, it's, it's, it, it's true that, that uh, we, we are, we are suppo supporting uh, what, uh, what uh, Ibika is doing. Uh, it's it's uh, fantastic uh, what, what you are doing. I want, would like to congratulate you for, for your, your efforts. Um, you know, we are uh, an energy company present in 70 different countries, and uh, uh, it is always uh, surprising to, to, to see that uh, um, uh, we also are in water business, water distribution. One billion people on, on the planet have no access to clean water, and two billion uh, no access to electricity. Uh, and uh, among this uh, figure, 800 million in Asia. So uh, everything can, can be done in order to, to help uh, people to, to be connected to electricity uh, needs to be, to be done. So of course, no company can, can do it alone, of course, uh, and we have to rely on, on local NGOs, local associations, uh, local operators, and uh, we have decided at the GDF Suez level to create a project, what we call uh, in French, Rassembleur d'Energy, it is a gathering people for energy in order to, uh, uh, to help projects, local projects with three means. First one is a soft loan uh, through a fund that will have uh, to start 100 million euros, that's not bad. Uh, secondly, we have a foundation uh, in order to, to give uh, subsidies. Uh, and third, um, technical assistance. And we do this technical assistance through uh, uh, our volunteers. Uh, we have 2,000 people, employees of GDF Suez, uh, that we do not pay for that. They, they, they have decided on a voluntary basis to spend their holidays, to spend their, their, their weekends, to participate to projects, most of them uh, being in uh, emerging countries, mm -hmm. in order to create locally, to help in a, mm -hmm. uh, on a, uh, a micro, uh, yeah. micro uh, hydro project, or in order to connect a, a small village to electricity, or to create a, a well and the pump for, for, for clean water. 
Mm. Because that's, that's, it is very important. Uh, we do not make uh, many uh, external publicity on that, but mm. for our own employees, that's very, very important for the, for the, the solidarity within, within the company and the unity of the company. Oh, okay, that's very, uh, very nice to hear. I want to get back out to the audience uh, again. Uh, what strikes me is this. We've, part of this conversation has been about cost. It's been about affordability. Um, we know that a lot of economies in this part of the world are grappling with price pressures, inflation, soft side, foods, etc., but also obviously uh, energy. And I had this thought, oh, I don't know, about a week ago. And I want to put this question to the audience. And again, just a yes or no answer, uh, if you could. Pressures on government right now to cap prices, extend or increase subsidies may be politically expedient. It may basically be related to a government's survival, but it may be also bad economics. So the question I want to ask you is this. Okay, how worried are you that it could be politically expedient but lead to bad economics if governments cave in? Worried or not worried is, is the choice. Yes worried, show of hands? Oh my gosh, it's about four. Not worried? Okay, all right, not getting much... Uh, <laughs> response here. Okay, maybe it was a bad question. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, look, it was. Uh, all right, it was something that I was. Uh, I've been wondering. In any case, uh, does anybody have? Would people like to engage? Question, comment about what we've been talking about, discussing this afternoon, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Santoso. I'm from Green Radio. And as part of the 30% of this room who say no to nuclear, I think I should say something. <clears throat> I think for Indonesia, Ibu Karen, the future energy will be for the solar, because we have a lot, and 20, sorry, 12 hours a day, uh, solar energy. And if we really focus on it, uh, research and also developing, I think it's very potential for us. So we don't need nuclear, actually, because first we can get from other resources and the future is for solar. And the second, many people say that we live in the, in the ring of fire, which is very dangerous and natural disaster happen here. So I think the case of Fukushima is something that will be very common happen here. Okay, would you like one of our panelists specifically to respond to that or? I think Ibu can. <laughs> For Ibu, okay. Uh, makasi, thank you. Um, yes, I do hear you. Um, uh, please bear in mind that uh, it is al always about human capacity. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, I'm not talking that nuclear energy will be in here in the next 30 to 40 years. Uh, yes, of course, we can develop all types of energy, uh, starting from uh, the non-fossil fuel, be it geothermal, be it CBM, be it solar, be it wind, you know. Um, uh, it, it's, everything is, is there basically in Indonesia. But uh, I'm, I'm one of a person that is not uh, close-minded. I'm always open because I like to learn new things, you know. And um, it, is, it, it is something that we need to be ready in terms of human resources. You know, I'm not saying that we have to be ready to build it, but in terms of human resources, we need to be ready. Yeah? Um, I don't want us, you know, uh, in this uh, Southeast Asia region, if you look, uh, you know, Singapore is ahead of us. We just spoke to the Prime Minister of Thailand. Uh, they're ahead of us, you know, I mean, in terms of human capacity. Uh, they know all about nuclear. I mean, I think they already have a small pilot project in Thailand. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, you have to build a power plant here in Indonesia, but please be ready when the time is, you know, when the time comes. It is all about human resources. Yeah, I think in the Southeast Asia, I think we are left behind now from Thailand. We are left behind now from Malaysia, Indonesia. We are left behind now from Vietnam. 
Yeah, I think this is a, 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 an alert for our uh, country, basically, in terms of human resources. Okay, I, I, I hear you too. Uh, but let's get back to Tree Mumpuni and talk about this approach where it's decentralized and also localized. Micro hydro, do you struggle with these sorts of um, human skill or technical skill capacity challenges and how do you, how do you deal with it? No, basically this is a very major uh, technology which actually we learned for the first time it's from uh, European countries that transferring the know-how and technology and now we have the capacity ourselves, Indonesian, we have to be uh, share this with others. That's why we have a possibility, you know, uh, 2006, we have three years, uh, you know, transferring this know-how to Philippines because they ask us and we go from one village to another village and we soon go going to, to Rwanda, to Africa and there is an over, you know, from Fiji also waiting for us. Can, can we share with this? It means that uh, they have a belief that even though big is necessary, you know, like all of you are big things, you know, but small is beautiful and needed by the local community because they, you know, this is, this is the thing. That, and more to the point. And, and we don't have any problem with the technicalities, but okay. one thing I always, you know, uh, share with, with all the engineers, you know, that, that actually uh, implementing that, make sure that you bring the technology close enough to the local community. So through training, they should have the know-how, the capability, and understanding how to run and operate. Even if there is a capability available, we ask them to join us to go to the workshop and they can manufacture themselves. This is very important because right. what we have to do is we creating dignity and also independent, you mm. know, uh, of the local community. So they are able to be independent from outside uh, mm. sources. Okay. Because, because, you know, we have here so huge tasks, the government also, you know, so we have to make sure that if there is capability that we can transfer to them, why not? Just do it. This is what happened. So if I have to go back to your question, in terms of technology, micro and mini hydro is actually very mature technology. That's if you, you know that in Japan, it's uh, one of the small micro hydro is like 110 years already old. And then in Europe, more than 50 years. You know. Okay, but, but I think your point is even at a local level, it is still doable because you're doable. doing it. Doable. Have you and considered solar? Yeah, uh, well, different. Okay. The story with the solar different. Solar PV, it is the most expensive. Mm -hmm. And in terms of efficiency of the, of the uh, energy, also you cannot get as like a hydro. Of course, it's different, mm -hmm. you know, because you have to, to really calculate, uh, you know, the sun in the peak. Uh, peak hours, you have to calculate that. And also, uh, I have to respond to my colleague here that uh, solar PV is mostly the technology is still in the developed countries, you know, like German, America, Japan, you know, Indonesia, up till now, still do not have the capability, even though actually the, the raw material is available here. But uh, sorry that our countries not spend enough, enough fun to research on that. So up till now, we still do not have the capability even just to make the waffle of the solar PV. Mm. That is it's a very, very hard uh, task for us, but we have to go that because there is a plenty of sun, you know, uh, like uh, 12 hours in Indonesia, you know. Okay, I bring up this point because I mean, the cost of PV uh, aside, uh, there's one school of thought that believes with solar, if you can localize it within a village or a community, etc., and have them generate their own power just on the rooftops, basically look, one of the big problems with uh, uh, conventional is there's a lot of inefficiency and loss through the through transmission, mm -hmm. through the grid. But if it's right there, a source where it's needed or closer to it, uh, it just seems to make a lot of sense to me. Anybody else want to jump in with a question sir. or a comment, sir? Colin. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we'll come to you next. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Salim Ali. I'm a professor at the University of Vermont in the U.S. Originally from Pakistan. And I'm wondering if the panelists can comment on the issue of conservation of energy, which seems to have been missed completely because we've got an invisible power generation potential uh, just from improving conservation and efficiency, especially in the transmission sector. We've estimated in Pakistan that 80% of our energy demand could be met by improving transmission efficiency in some of the urban ah, areas. Okay. And who would you like to comment uh, on this? 
free for all who would like to, Melody, I'd go ahead. I'd be happy to. Yeah. You know, I, I think the cheapest and most plentiful form of energy is conservation and efficiency. And, and, and with a very rigorous process of baselining, understanding consumption, and creating awareness around um, energy usage, there is a real opportunity to reduce consumption and, be, and become efficient in communities, cities, um, offices, and, and um, you know, with major companies. I mean, my, my company, 10 years ago, we started baselining and measuring our own energy usage. And over the last 10 years, we've reduced our, our energy footprint, our, person, our usage in our company by about 27 percent, almost 30 percent. So a very rigorous process of understanding how to, how to reduce your own mm. consumption. Okay. Um, another comment I'll make just about solar, I think efficiency is so, uh, efficiency and conservation. You know, one of the challenges with solar, I've heard a scientist say, is night, of course, you know, and technology has a role there to play with solar as well. But finding creative ways to apply solar energy is also essential. Uh, one of our heavy oil operations in, in the U.S., we're piloting a technology to convert solar to steam so that we can reduce our usage of natural gas for steam generation and mm -hmm. use solar as a supplement. So that pilot is a significant technology pilot to see how we can use solar energy as a supplement to displace other, other energy usages that can be used elsewhere. So technology plays a, an important role, you know, in, in solar and uh, conservation plays uh, and, and efficiency plays a very significant role yeah. in meeting energy demand. Absolutely. Gerard, you wanted to? Uh... <clears throat> yeah, yes, you were absolutely right to mention energy conservation because uh, energy conservation, energy savings, energy efficiency has to, to be put in common factor of uh, every uh, energy policy everywhere in the, in the world because the, the, the cheapest megawatt hour is the one we do not consume. Uh, and we save. Um, I see the, a difference uh, also in, in emerging countries and in Europe or in the States. Uh, in emerging countries, uh, the, the, the basic need is to, to have enough power, enough energy to accompany the, the growth. Um, uh, in Europe, uh, it is a little bit different. The approach is different because the Europe has decided uh, very strong commitments, strong targets in order to reduce energy consumption. Mm -hmm. So as a, a power producer and, and we sell uh, megawatt hour and cubic meters of natural gas in Europe, we've decided, uh, especially because we are mainly in, uh, in Europe for half of our activities, um, we, we, to integrate the fact that uh, we will sell less uh, electricity, less natural gas in the future. And therefore, we have created a full a division uh, dedicated to energy efficiency, which is a big one. We have 77,000 people working in that division um, uh, in order to help our customers, either uh, individual uh, uh, corporations or uh, um, local uh, municipalities, local entities, to, to reduce their consumption and also to, to design differently their, their plants uh, and to, to, to have a, a different vision of their energy future. Mm -hmm. so, so it's absolutely uh, uh, important and key. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there are two things on, on the efficiency, you know. As as if we learn from Pertamina, that's our, our uh, oil and gas company, that so many uh, flare, you know, they, they just never using it. I can imagine how many uh, megawatt that actually we can catch, you know, from, from that flare, you know. And this is the first thing. The second thing is whenever you talk about the efficiency, you have to also talking about the price, pricing, pricing policy. It's a hit in a very, you know, important uh, aspect. Most of the developing countries, especially Indonesia, we put so much subsidy that is taking uh, for granted for, for those who are already having the electricity, they think that this is so cheap, so they don't have any notion of, you know, making this, uh, you know, efficiency in, in their, uh, you know, behavior. This is, I, I learned that, that really, you know, uh, very closely. Once we have an example in one village that actually coffee producer, you know, we put an expensive, but based on 
on the agreement by the community. Once they know that the energy is expensive per kilowatt hour, they use it very efficiently. Because why? They want to pay as small as possible. If you want to pay as small as possible, so you have to really have an awareness. It's mm. close in your, in your uh, mind. So whenever you don't use that energy, you just turn off everything. You know, this is, this is very important. You have to, to really, you know, culturally put this uh, attitude of uh, saving the energy is because you have to pay. As long as you give a uh, subsidy in huge, uh, you know, uh, numbers, then people will just take it easy that this is, you know, well, my, my comment that on, it's very important on having a pricing policy to, to be able to address your issue. People can be, you know, uh, efficient using the energy. So do away with subsidies, do away with price controls, let the market determine the price, and then people will be forced to be more energy efficient. Definitely. They, have to <laughs> they don't want to spend so much money on energy. Oh. That's, that's the reason okay. why. Interesting. All right. Anybody? Uh, oh, there's a moment in the front row. Martin, I just wanted to... Uh, Please. Uh, I think uh, in one of the uh, programs which was discussed actually in Vienna, um, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, was 20% uh, uh, reduction in, uh, in emissions, 20% uh, in renewable power, and 20% improvement in efficiency, to, to, to his point, mm. uh, by 2020. And I think this kind of a program, uh, at least uh, for, for, for a region, for our region, makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. I mean, and I fully agree with uh, with uh, Ibu that, you know, uh, subsidies, and in India there's a huge subsidies, uh, is, uh, does um, uh, provide the consumer the ability to, to afford waste because, because it's not costing him the true, true market value. So somebody else is paying for right. more of it, well, in this case the government. Uh, the gentleman in the front row, sir. Hi, my name is Samir Briko. I'm uh, Chief Executive of AMEC. I have a couple of comments and also a couple of uh, questions. Uh, I think it was very good that you mentioned the issue about conservation because I think it got a little bit lost in the beginning of the conversation, but we picked it up because, as you said, in many of the places, we can actually save quite a lot of consumption by, by conservation. But in order to do that also in Asia, you need to have an unbelievable educational system and about how are we using electricity, how are we using energy, how are we using actually water. And when I go on the streets of Jakarta, I don't see that yet. So I think there is a quite a lot of catch-up which we need to do because everybody in the emerging market would like to have the same living standards maybe as it is in the U.S. or in Europe, and they have the dream in order to be able so mobile as they can, and they think that by copying maybe some of the bad habits in the U.S. and in Europe, that's a good thing to do. <laughs> but, so there is a quite a lot of learning actually which we, can, which we can take from there in order not to make the same type of mistakes that maybe other cultures have been going through. Okay. When it comes to efficiency, it's very important when we speak about efficiency is that there are the grid systems, there are technologies today, and the HVDC, for instance, high voltage direct current, that's what the Chinese are using this on a big time. You can move thousands of megawatts from the western side to the eastern side where the consumption is taking place. But also you need to pay for this. I mean, it's not free of charge. And, and, and one of the questions which I have is that to the panel, there's a lot of R&D has been spent on HVDCs, there's a lot of R&D has been spent on solar, on, on hydro, on, 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 on biofuels, or also wind farms, or even oil and gas industry. But how much at the end of the day is going to be transferred from the R&D to the consumer at the end of the day? Is the consumer ready today in Asia to pay double the price or triple the price? That's the question one. I'm an engineer by background, so I can do as many green power generation as you want. <laughs> but who's going to pay for this? When we speak about solar, and I'm not going to attack solar, I think solar needs to be part of the equation, and we need to continue to work on that. But just to give you a feeling, to produce one megawatt of solar, you need to have 2.4 hectares of land, which is 2.4 acres of land, which is one hectare for one megawatt. If I put you a gas turbine or a diesel generator set of one a megawatt, I can get this on this stage. Just to give you a feeling about how, what is the footprint we are talking about. When we speak about wind, it's great. I think it needs to be part of the equation. The utilization factor of wind is about 22 to 25 percent. 
In the UK, just to give you an example, in 2010, bad winter, which means that was very cold winter, did not have so much winds. Very good summers, we did not have winds. The utilization factor dropped from 22% to 10%, mm. which means that the 2,500 megawatts which are installed on the grid are giving not more than 10% of it. That means 250 megawatts. That doesn't sound so exciting. <laughs> you see, so we have issues. So my question to the panel, we need to think about, and what is, your, what is your view? What is carbon pricing is going to play for this? Who is going to pay for the R&D? How much the consumers are want to pay for this? And what will be the pass forward? Wow, OK, so a lot of questions here. Can Let's I, uh, I, see who wants to tackle this first. <laughs> Ibu? I think, I think, I think I'd like to have the first pass on this. Uh, I like, I like your, uh, your firing up the, uh, the room now uh, uh, on, on this issue. Um, I, we, we had lots of discussions about this, right? And I think uh, we know that for alternative energy, technology comes first in line, and that costs, uh, that, that, that is expensive. And, uh, you know, if, 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 if uh, you know, as, a, as an investor, as, uh, you know, private sectors, I think w what we like to do is, is an open book transparency on, you know, what is, what is the capped IRR that we are allowed to have for this, you know, uh, uh, developing this uh, alternative energy. And, you know, uh, then uh, calculate it backwards and see what is the price of, of energy, you know, uh, 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 produced by that technology. But the main problem is, Samir, in this part of the world, I mean, as long as you have the subsidy, there is no clear comparison because you have the subsidy and everything, everyone in, in the country is comparing it to the subsidy price, not to the real market price. Now, unless you take out the subsidy, then this alternative energy can move up and, and can take place uh, to replace the fossil fuel. But if that doesn't happen, you know, until uh, if, if Indonesia say tahun kuda, you know, it will never happen. Yeah, it will never happen. So you need to take out the subsidy first, bring it up, the renewable energy, at the market price. And we, we can take all the technology costs that, yeah, that you, you know, with, as an engineer background, Samir can do anything, uh, you know, uh, very creative uh, alternative energy. But okay. without that, that's not going to happen. All right. So Ibu, yeah, Ibu, theoretically, I agree with you. I think the problem with subsidies is, I think, it's a, it's a classic political problem. What, mm -hmm. Once you've given it, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to, to take it away. Gerard, you wanted to comment? Yes, that, that, that's a, a very good question. Uh, and uh, I agree with Mr. Uh, Tanya Brico that, uh, that that's a question for all the governments everywhere in the world. That, that is typically a, a big one in, in Europe because uh, Europe has decided to have very ambitious targets in terms of renewables. But if we today uh, uh, even uh, the, the, the wind farms onshore have to be subsidized, uh, wind farm offshores massively subsidized, uh, solar uh, photovoltaic also, and uh, therefore and you don't pay only once, um, uh, you pay uh, three times. I would like to explain that. Uh, having said that, as a, as a group, we, we participate because it's a logical decision to invest uh, when we are an energy group uh, because of the price of the subsidy, subsidy the price of the uh, electricity which is bought by the government. It's, a, it's an economic choice for one single company, perhaps not for the collectivity. That's another, another problem, which is the problem you, you mentioned, because sometimes it is paid by the consumer, sometimes by the taxpayer. Let's take an example, an island, I like this again. You take an island which uh, has a need of 1,000 megawatt uh, for people, for industries, 1,000 megawatt. This island, the government of this island wants to be green, so decides to put 1,000 megawatt of uh, wind farms. Okay, that's perfect. That's perfect, but uh, only when there is wind and there is wind uh, for 30% of the time. For 70% of the time, there is no wind and no, no production. And since electricity cannot be stored, uh, it's difficult because the, the consumers want to have electricity 24 hours a day. So you have your 1,000 megawatt of wind, you need to buy, to, to build 1,000 megawatt of uh, uh, alternative of uh, not solar, not, not yet solar, because 
uh, unfortunately during the night there, there, is, there is no no sun and you need electricity even during the night during the night so basically uh, gas fired turbine that you can switch on very easily uh, when there is no wind and switch off when there is wind so the result of that first you have to build not 1,000 corresponding to the, the need, but two times, 2,000. 1,000 in, so, in wind, 1,000 in gas fire. Secondly, you have to subsidize wind because without subsidy, you would not get uh, wind uh, construction, wind farm construction. And you pay a third time uh, on the gas turbine because gas turbine could work 100% of the time but in that particular case, you stop them one during 30% of the time. So the, the cost of the investment is higher, 30% higher in that case. So you, 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 you pay three times. But that's perhaps a choice of the governments, but the choice has to be taken uh, in, in, in the awareness of this, uh, of this cost paid either by the taxpayer or by the, by the, 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 the consumer. For sure. I think I'll uh, take only two points uh, in addition. I think on the, as regards the subsidy element, we have seen, uh, for example, in India, in all the major cities, the price of power going up by 300 uh, percent. And the price of power today is in line with the market, what it costs and on market forces uh, at about 15 or 16 cents. Uh, which is quite expensive for, uh, for India from an affordability perspective. But even at that price, the consumer is not complaining mm -hmm. as long as he gets 24 hours continuous power so, or electricity. So that, that's sort of a good example from who's, you know, if you take away the subsidy, would the consumer be willing to pay as long as he good, gets good, reliable uh, power? And on the second point, uh, with regard to uh, who's to pay, I think, again, uh, that's one of the reasons why renewable, whether it's solar, whether it's uh, wind, has to be a part of the solution, but not the entire solution. And therefore, at least uh, we are coming up with, a, in India, we are coming up with a 20% yeah, yeah. renewable number, which will cost more to generate, mm -hmm. but will be, uh, on, a, on average, uh, the cost of power will be less because the rest of the 75% or 80% can generate power at a lower price. And, and the average is what the consumer uh, will pay. I'm not sure if that sort of addresses part of your answer, but. I think I'm also of the opinion that we, we should increase the price and then take out the subsidy, because otherwise we're living in an artificial world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, I just would like to, to address also one thing. Maybe uh, we are talking about the East and Asia, you know, uh, context, that we understand not the whole community or people that can afford, you know, to have an energy. And I believe that energy is also human right that the government should provide. So in a way of talking about subsidy, when you're talking about subsidy, doesn't mean that subsidy has to be taken off all of them. But I just make an example very easy for Indonesia. We have 26 million a consumer. Uh, household consumer on the using of the electricity and and it's so easy because the database is on our utility so why don't you just set up a criteria that if people are using only 30 kilowatt hour up to 50 kilowatt hour per month it is a family that needs subsidy so directed subsidy to the family that actually you know, looking for the, their consumption is so easy. But now it's, it's incredible because the subsidy goes for, you know, we enjoy subsidy now in this hotel and, and, and also, you know, for the very luxurious apartment and everything. Exactly, but it's very hard, you know. Okay. okay, this is getting interesting. We have time for one quick last question. Any takers? Uh, the gentleman on the left, please. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Gandhi, I'm from UBM. Uh, I agree to this thought that you know, the energy mix has, must include uh, all the different sources. But as far as renewables are concerned, many countries are like giving other policies. And the thought process, I believe, is uh, because of the economics of scale. Uh, for example, China is now giving a lot of subsidy on LED lighting. They believe that you know, in the beginning, by giving that subsidy, the volume will grow and then they can remove it. So the economic scale could be reached. So I'm not sure what's your thought in that process. Who would you like to respond to that? 
Uh, anyone, please. Anybody who would like to take that? Melody? So, okay. Well, I, you know, re renewables um, need to be competitive at scale without subsidy. And, um, the, the, you know, we talked about the R&D investments that are required to, to get renewables competitive at, at scale. What you're describing is, you know, a, a period of time where you uh, provide investors an opportunity to invest in the t into the operation so that the technology will follow. And there have been examples, um, I know coal bed methane in the United States was an example of, uh, uh, of that occurring, but it's not, um, you know, it's not a sustainable model um, in general. So, okay. th you know, I, I, I imagine that um, you know, it, it could be a possibility that that would work, but um, th that is not a sustainable long-term, you know, operation for, for a, for a uh, resource to be developed. So it has to be a sustainable operation for investors to be able to invest in a renewable. And, uh, you know, I think the, the primary focus should be on the R&D, uh, the research and development pilot projects, um, applying those pilot projects in unique ways to make those uh, pilots successful so that they could eventually be applied at scale without subsidies is the, is the best model. Okay. Uh, what we need to do right now is we're bumping up against the limits of time. In 30 seconds, let's just swing around the whole panel. Give me a key takeaway from this whole discussion, either an idea or something that's actionable, starting with Prashant. I mean, uh, I think key takeaway from, from my perspective is, is that uh, in, for our region, we need to find a, uh, a solution which, which encompasses all forms of, all forms of energy generation. Uh, and in the larger countries, certainly, uh, like India, also nuclear. Okay. And uh, there is clearly a huge scope for improvement uh, in, in conservation and, um, and in reduce, reduction and renewable generation. Okay. Uh, and obviously, there's a huge investment required. Uh, to improve the technology quickly so that it can be, key, can be affordable and sustainable. Melody? Asia Pacific is a very growing region. It's an and world. We're going to need all forms of uh, energy at scale, and uh, it's just important to continue to stay focused on all forms of energy, including conservation. Ibu? I think uh, with the current economic growth of, of Indonesia, uh, we should be uh, 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 fully aware that we need all kinds of energy. And uh, um, I think we also uh, need to be aware that uh, new alternative energy costs uh, is very uh, expensive. And I think uh, in, in this part of the world, uh, the education of, I think, the younger generations of, you know, subsidy and also alternative energy should be given at an early stage. Let's consider small scale, sustainable, local ownership. Okay, sure. Um, the, uh, in every country, there is no one solution. The solution is in the mix, a mix of energy, what we call a bucket of, uh, of energy, which will be different from one country to another country. And in Indonesia has the uh, chance to have uh, coal, to have gas, to have water, uh, to have solar, uh, sun and, and, and also uh, geothermal. So uh, Indonesia uh, is uh, one of the most favored countries in that sense. Well, to have it all. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll have to leave the session there. Thank you for taking part, for being with us. Enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>